Hello, I am Dr. Thomas Panetta, and this is the Society for Vascular Surgery Briefing about setting up an outpatient center for dialysis access imaging and intervention. Office-based surgery is increasingly evolving as a healthcare option for dialysis patients for many reasons. Minimally invasive procedures have been developed for most interventions that are required to develop and maintain access function in the dialysis population. Renal failure patients prefer to be treated in an office surgery center rather than in a hospital for many reasons. Pre-admission testing is not required, waiting times are reduced, renal failure patients are not relegated to the bottom of the surgery list and avoid waiting in emergency rooms. They feel that they have physicians that are specialized and dedicated to their overall care, whether it be elective, semi-urgent, or urgent interventions. Procedures are less likely to be canceled, hospital-acquired infections are avoided, and patient satisfaction is improved. In order to set up an outpatient dialysis access and intervention center, a physician needs to understand legal and credentialing issues, safety requirements, best practice guidelines, and financial implications. Because of the time constraints, I hope to give you a brief introduction to these four important topics on which complete guidelines can be obtained from many of your state and federal agencies. First, an understanding of legal implications is paramount. An office-based surgery center is different than an ambulatory surgery center in that it is legally considered an extension of a physician's office and therefore does not require Article 28 certification. Existing statutes, rules, and regulations vary from state to state. Currently, only 28 states have varying degrees of office-based surgery regulations, even though more than 10 million procedures are done yearly in the United States. For states requiring accreditation, it is only for facilities using moderate conscious sedation or anesthesia. There are four credentialing agencies, including the Joint Commission. Although we use only minimal sedation in over 99% of cases in our access intervention facilities, we were accredited by the Joint Commission. This process did require a commitment, but was comparatively easier than requirements for hospital or Article 28 facilities. Again, there are comprehensive accreditation manuals that provide an extensive overview of the requirements, which include governance, credentialing, quality control, medical record keeping, and environmental issues. The second issue is safety. Mortalities for office-based procedures vary and have been reported at rates varying from 1.7 to 19 per 100,000 procedures performed. National safety guidelines exist and must be followed. Some of the important requirements for safety include ACLS-trained personnel, medication safety, especially lowering the narcotics delivered incrementally to achieve conscious sedation, monitoring vital signs, EKG, and pulse oximetry, only performing safe procedures, including maturations of fistulas, declots, and angioplasties, and best practice of medicine. Many access centers also perform peripheral angiograms and interventions. Thirdly, best practice for office-based surgery includes facility accreditation, physician training and competency, appropriate patient and procedure selection, informed consent, anesthesia, and conscious sedation guidelines, preventing drug name mix-ups, facility maintenance, specific emergency and resuscitative training for personnel, emergency transfer protocols, reporting adverse events, and disclosure of adverse outcomes. Finally, there are specific financial incentives for office-based surgery. Medicare reimbursements are increased due to the recognition of less expensive overall care for office-based surgery compared to hospital care for the renal failure population. Additionally, cost savings may be rewarded by the upcoming Obama health care legislation. In conclusion, combining a fistula first program with office-based maturation and maintenance of fistulas will reduce the need for catheters, provide better patient care, and ultimately save lives. We have been able to achieve a rate of more than 90% functioning fistulas with improved patency in our patient population utilizing this approach. Thank you for your attention. This briefing is made possible by a grant from Cook Medical. To learn more about vascular health, visit vascularweb.org.